how are you today? Yay, three of you are awake. Awesome. Hey, will you stand up on your feet with us as we get ready to worship the Lord in song? Ah, Jesus, we just come to you this morning with an open heart, Father, for just focusing on you and worshiping you, giving all the praise you deserve. And everybody said, Amen. amen. You came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You blew me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. participation please can you get your hands together remember it's not about us it's about the king today let's bring our sacrifice of praise Sing for your 
song of endless praise the future the future is an open door you give us hope for so much more I'll see that. Hallelujah, you have overcome your grace. You made a way for us. Every single battle you have won. Your will, so be it, Lord, your will be done. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah, you have overcome your grace. You made a way for us. Every single battle you have won. It's replaced by your love, by your love, by your love. We've overcome. We have overcome by your blood. We have overcome by your love. Yeah. We've overcome by the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad to just be able to sing songs like that? We don't serve a God who is dead. We don't serve a God who is defeated. But we overcome by Him. It's through the blood of Jesus that we can sing a hallelujah, that we can raise a victory song. How about that? Let's raise a hallelujah in this place this morning. Come on. Peace. 
darkness flee I will watch the darkness flee
Worthy is the Lamb. 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 Worthy is the Lamb.
and they surround your throne. They always sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. You're Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. You're Holy, Holy, Holy.
scripture tells us to be holy as you are holy so father we just want to come closer to you god so we can be more like you we can be holy but for now we celebrate your holiness hallelujah lord he's so holy come on just one final time can you lift up your voice and just let him know he's holy use your heart use your words you're holy god and i think you're holy Nobody like our God. Just take a couple of minutes. Tell those people around you that he, there's nobody like him. Just welcome each other, greet each other, and just keep it focused on the king. Hey.
How you doing? How y'all doing? You doing good? You enjoying that weather out there? And also, are you enjoying the arrangements as you walk into the church? Those are so beautiful. Make sure you give Miss Renee Goss a big well done. She loves it. And Addie Kate helped as well. Hey, you found my sermon. Thank you. I can preach now. Let me put the computer away. <laughs> All right, with that being said, since the kids are excited, if you're ages 5 to 11 and you're ready to go to kids' church, will you please stand up? Will all the kids please stand up? All right. Who's our kids' worker today? Hey, you Miss Diana Goss. All right, you guys are in for a treat. You may go to kids' church. Miss Trish is helping out today. Awesome. All right, while they are going, let me give you just a quick couple of tidbits of family business. And also, at the end, when Brother Mike Denny comes to take the offering, he's going to tell you the announcements for the day, too. That's a big wink right there, letting them know they're right here. Well, hey, for those of you who came out to Crude's yesterday, I hope you had a great time. We uh, invaded the Scottsboro Cinemas. We had quite a few families there. We ate some popcorn and some Coke and uh, learned about Wigasis. And uh, if you've not seen the Crudes movie, it's cute. It's fun. It's awesome. And the Thunder Sisters. Yes, you got to watch Crudes too. Uh, secondly, and a little more importantly, last week we had the Father's House with us. And I want to say thank you guys for meeting my challenge of doubling our monthly giving. We, we brought in double uh, what we give to them, and so they're getting double this month. So thank you, Jesus. Yes, thank you. If you were not here and you missed the Father's House, please go on to Life Chapel Facebook. Last week's message was brought to you by about three or four of their own ladies who have testimonies, and they shared it, and it was powerful. And it was so amazing. And there was lots of ministry that happened at the end as well. And that was so good. Well, let's jump into today's message. We're actually going to be starting a new series. It's called Deep Faith. Now, a few weeks, well, honestly, a couple of months ago, when I was thinking about just meditating on the Lord one day in the church and the sermon series, the Lord kind of led my thoughts in a, in a path that was kind of fun. It, it, he, he started leading me into this concept of deep faith. And when I thought about it at first, I was thinking uh, immediately about a scripture in Timothy I'll share with you in just a few minutes. But over these next few weeks, I think the Lord wants to do some really neat things teaching us about our past, how to live in our present, so we can create a legacy for our future. And so these next few weeks are going to be fun. I'll, I'll have some very um, unique stories to tell and, and, and just some great stuff. So with that being said, let me pray. We'll jump right into the message for today. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful that you are holy. God, you're holy. You're different. There's no one like you. And you're just, you're awesome. So, Lord, we praise you. Father, I pray that today that you'll open our ears, open the ears of our hearts, open the ears of our understanding so that, may, uh, so that we may hear your word, hear what you want to say to us, and so that we can deepen our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So when the Lord started reminding me of deep faith, he brought a few, I guess you could say, uh, categories to that. I mean, if you think of the word faith, there are so many meanings, so many definitions to faith. Faith is a word that could mean um, unlimited possibilities. Have faith of a mustard seed, and you'll say to this mountain, be removed to cast it to the sea, right? It means faith could also include generational legacies. It also could mean foundational truths. These are things that faith refers to. Now, when it comes to the actual meanings of faith, here's a few. The biblical definition of faith is the most obvious. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Uh, another definition of faith could very simply be the belief in the existence of something or someone unseen with the natural eyes. 
Another meaning could be being convinced that someone will act on your behalf without proof or collateral that they will. The, the definitions of faith just go on and on and on. The implications of faith are even bigger. When we talk about deep faith, including foundational truths, let me go there for a minute. Foundational truths. Let's, let's, let's simplify faith. Very simply, faith for us is the belief in God. Okay, yeah, so we're in church. We believe in God. Yay. But a lot of people don't believe in something they cannot see with their natural eyes, right? It's easy for us here in the deep south. Always been raised around the Lord. You know, even the country music we listen to is talking about it's God's country. You know what I mean? It's just so easy to be surrounded by God that you believe in him. But there's this place you come to where you actually have to choose to believe in him. You know what I mean? So being convinced that God is, is just about the most foundational element of faith. You know, I was reminded of this story my dad told me the other day, and he, he, he talked about this scientist who was an atheist who didn't believe in God. He believed in he can create his own, and he challenged God. He said, hey, God, I can create everything that you can create. God said, oh, really? Yeah, and, and the scientist looked up to him, yeah, how about we make a challenge right here? I'm going to create life. Okay, God said, you go first. Well, the scientist began picking up some dirt to help form uh, the life, and God slapped his hand. God said, hey, go get your own dirt. I made that. Ha, 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 ha. You know, um, I, was, I was on my, my weekly run yesterday with uh, a buddy of mine who teaches Sunday school at First Baptist. And uh, we were talking about his classes. He's teaching apologetics, which means um, learning how to give a defense for your faith. And he, he began to share with me just a whole bunch of really good stuff. Like, you know, can something come from nothing? No, something has to come from something. You know, there has to be this, this original thing. And we know by faith and by even evidence in the, in the greater scope of humanity, that something is God. God was the original. From him all things come from. So we have faith in God. It's just a foundational truth of what we believe. Now, what's even beyond that, not beyond that, but a part of that is the simple belief in the work of salvation through Jesus Christ. Being convinced that he has an eternal plan that exhibits selfless love and goodwill to us. Do you remember the, the Christmas angels who came? Peace on earth, goodwill toward mankind. We believe in the goodness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God. That's a foundational truth that you need to, to have and to hold and to keep. Because if you don't believe your God is good, then you believe that your God is bad and he's not. And you begin to live differently. It's that whole, um, I serve God because I have to, because he could squash me if I wanted to. It's a fear-based serving of God. And that's a shaky foundation. We know that he has good things in store for those who love him and call upon him. A third foundational truth is very simply the belief in the eternal companionship of Holy Spirit. You know, if you, if you look in the Greek, Holy Spirit, Jesus said that he would send another helper. That word, another helper, in the Greek is paraclete, which is similar to the woman's uh, the definition. When God gave Adam a woman, when God gave Adam a woman, that woman was called a helper, a uh, paraclete. They're, they're very similar, and it goes to show the companionship. Holy Spirit comes inside of us when we ask Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior. And when we're aware that God gave us the gift of himself via the Holy Spirit to abide in our hearts, we have a hope, and we have the seal of eternal redemption. These are just some, just some foundational uh, truths about faith. Faith is a word with many meanings, many unlimited possibilities, generational legacies, and foundational truths. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of Walt Disney? Okay, um, I think that was a simple question. He wasn't necessarily known for being a believer, right? But he was a man of extraordinary faith. 
Here's the thing. Even non-believers can operate in faith and in, in, in realize ginormous results. I mean, the Walt Disney World controls everything almost, you know, from media to theme parks to the movies we watch to our kids' attitudes. <laughs> yeah, we've had to deal with that a few times. But Walt Disney was a man of faith. He, he saw something in here that couldn't be seen in the natural, but he kept working out his faith and created something amazing. It, it's just like unlimited possibilities. But here's the cool thing. When you and I as believers, those who have fellowship with God, properly point our faith toward God with purity and the sincere desire to see God's will come to pass, our faith will also manifest in works, in things that we can't even imagine on our own. Unlimited possibilities. You know the scripture in Ephesians 3.20, right? Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask, think, or imagine, to him be the glory in uh, the churches for all generations. It's a power that works in us, and it's the Holy Spirit partnering with us in faith to produce unlimited possibilities. See, deep faith can go so many different directions, but today I want us to focus on the, the direction of a generational legacy. We'll cover foundational truths and unlimited possibilities. We'll uncover that in a few weeks. But today, when you think of a generational legacy, obviously the best uh, tangible example is an inheritance, right? Well, he comes from a, a rich family. He got a rich uncle, you know what I mean? That's, that's like an inheritance passed down. But today we're talking about something obviously more spiritual, something deeper, the generational legacy of this. Faith can bless your family line. A lack of faith can cause a curse to remain on your family line. You, you can have faith and change your lineage. Or you can have a lack of faith and just let it be. Que sera, sera. And it's not that great. You know, when you, when you uh, think of this, have you ever had economics course? Have you ever heard of microeconomics or macroeconomics? I guess that's a terrible example. But anyways, you, you've heard of micro and then macro, right? Macro is big, micro is little. In church history, when you study revivals, you'll see a few macro revivals, just huge. You know, here in this, uh, before we were the United States, we had the Great Awakening that unified the hearts of men and women toward God so that when the British came, we are already in unity. And it helped us create this beautiful thing we call the United States of America. So you've got your macro revivals, but what about your micro revivals? I, I have to give a big shout out to my parents. My dad's here, mom's back there in one of the nurseries. How long have y'all been born again? 40 years? 70, what? I'm just kidding. What'd you say, sir? How's the joke? Sorry. 41 years. 41 years ago, they gave their hearts to Christ. There was a lot of junk they were living in at the time, a lot of things that I won't get into, but their life did a 180. And because they made that step into faith, my sister... And myself were blessed because of it. We are now from the household of faith. My sister loves the Lord. She serves him. I love the Lord. I serve him. If it hadn't have been for them stepping into faith, there's no telling where we'd be today. Let me, let me survey the audience here. How many of you are first generation Christians? You're the first in your family to be a Christian. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, how many of you are second, third, fourth, fifth generation? How many of you come from a legacy of faith? Cool. Man, that's exciting. Most of us in here. Whether you're a first generation or whether you're a second generation, you know the importance of deep faith. You, first generationers, you're setting the standards for your family lineage. For those of us who are second, third, fourth, fifth generationers, my goodness, we have a responsibility to keep and maintain that legacy for our future generations. Let me read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
verses 3 through 7. And again, a couple of months ago when the Lord was starting to kind of download this into my mind and my heart, this was the scripture that automatically came to pass. Let me give you some context. Paul, which is like, you know, St. Paul, he was writing to his spiritual son, not his natural son, Timothy. Timothy was kind of like Paul's protege. You know, Timothy did some traveling with Paul. Timothy was in Ephesus at this point. He was pastoring probably the largest church in the area of tens of thousands of people, and he didn't even have a microphone. Wow, could you imagine the communication frustrations that he dealt with, the hardships that he dealt with? Well, Paul wrote this to Timothy. He said, I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, so Paul was a multi-generation kid. When I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Now watch verse 5. This is, this is it. Clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois, then in your mother Eunice, and that I am convinced is in you also. Therefore I remind you, to, to keep ablaze the gift of God. I like one translation, uh, translation that says, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Generational legacies. We think of Timothy. He's got a couple books in the Bible. He's got a powerful uh, just life that he's living but who did it start with? That praying Grandma Lois and her daughter Eunice. Isn't that amazing? There's generational legacies that the, these ladies left to Timothy. It's powerful. Over these next few weeks, God is wanting you and I to understand that your faith isn't just about you. Let me say that again. Your faith isn't just about you. Your faith, this deep faith, is this beautifully entwined generational masterpiece of your spiritual heritage that preceded you and the legacy that you're leaving right now for those who are going to follow you. Think about that. If you get stuck in the past... You forfeit the opportunities of the present. I want you to envision in your mind a timeline of your ancestors and then your lineage to come. You're in the middle, right? If you get stuck in the past, whether it's your mistakes or the fact that your family members in the past may have served God, but they don't anymore. If you get stuck there, you forfeit the opportunity to live in the present. Today, you choose to serve the Lord. You don't base your now on your yesterday. Amen? Remember, today's called the present because it's a present. Open it and make a choice. If you get stuck in the present and forget about your heritage, you forfeit the maturity of wisdom. I know you may be thinking, well, I shouldn't I say the wisdom of maturity? No, because wisdom is far greater. There's maturity in getting wisdom. If you get stuck today thinking, I'm going to live this on my own. I don't need them. I got this. I'm going to trailblaze myself. If you forfeit the wisdom of the past, what a tragedy. There's so much to be learned from your heritage. I love the popular saying, learn history so you don't repeat it. Learn the mistakes of the past so you don't repeat it. Which is another really good excuse to tell the true history in schools and education systems, right? Amen to that. Let's pray for that, by the way. So we've dealt with the past. We're living in the present. But if you get stuck thinking about the future, you forfeit the building blocks of success for the next generation that they need as a foundation. Think about the, the parenting example. Parents, you know, you more experienced parents, you, you know what I'm about to say, but generation, my generation, this is important. We can't befriend our children at a young age. That's doing them an injustice, a, a, a an injustice and a disservice. 
but we have to be parents so that maybe one day in 30 years, 20 years, we can be their friend. If we get stuck all about the future, well, I want them to see, succeed at this. I want them to be great, so I'm just going to be their buddies and stuff like that. We forfeit the, the blessing of leaving them a foundation, a foundation to stand upon, those building blocks of success. Now, I mean, these are easy things to grasp in, in these examples, but think about it spiritually. If you and I are so, let's, let's use this last one. If we get stuck in the future, we forfeit the building blocks of success for the next generation. If we don't love those believers who are newer to the point where we want to disciple them, then we're just assuming they're on the same level of us spiritually, and then they may not grow. They may not have the same foundation you have. It's important to teach them. So let me do this. Let me jump into my one-liner for today. You ready? It's a lot, but just dissect it with me. Every believer must appreciate your heritage and anticipate your legacy by staying centered in your present. Every believer must appreciate your heritage. We're talking spiritually here. You must anticipate your legacy, meaning you have to know that you're leaving a legacy by the choices you make today. The way that you appreciate your heritage and anticipate your legacy is by staying centered in your present. And this is our model of deep faith. Let's go now to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to dissect this. We're going to open it up. We're going to let this make more sense to us from the scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Today, we're going to hit the highlights, but if you wanted to do like a, a deeper, in-depth Bible study, you're invited to join us on Wednesdays at 6.30. Um, I have to give uh, total cred, uh, credibility, credentials to the Bible study group that was here uh, last Wednesday. I'm a pretty smart pastor, so I let them do the Bible study on this last Wednesday so I could be more equipped to teach you today. So, you know, you may, you may hear some similar quotes. And anyways, with all that being said, uh, Bible study on this in depth on Wednesdays at 6.30 right here. We're going to be studying this passage of chapter 6 for a few weeks. Today, we're only going to take the first three verses um, and let me give you context here. In Deuteronomy, this was after the children of Israel had been freed from the slavery of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. The horse and the rider were thrown into the sea. That's referring to the Egyptians who were chasing them. They've already went through a few trials. Israel's already complained a little bit. Oh, where's my water? It would have been better to go back to Israel. At least they fed us some leeks or whatever. And then Moses had to deal with complaining and blah, 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 blah. But anyways, fast forward to now. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's read verses 1 through 3. As they wandered in the wilderness, this is what the command was. This is the command, the statutes and the ordinances the Lord your God has instructed me to teach you, so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I'm giving you, your son and your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. We're going to look into deep faith today, and there's five applications I want us to get from these three verses that we can apply to our lives that will teach us how to appreciate the past by staying centered in the present while anticipating our legacy to come. In verse chapter 1, the scripture says, The Lord your God has instructed me to teach you. The first application of deep faith is deep teaching. Deep teaching. God told Moses, teach the people. Now, you may think, teach, I'm not a teacher. Well, you don't have to be a teacher to teach, but teaching will make you a teacher, so become a teacher and teach. It's very simple. It's not that confusing. How do you teach? Well, use your own ways. Use your own method. Who do you teach? Well, you teach your legacy. You teach those around you. You teach those um, who are to come. Well, what do you teach? Will you teach the commands, the statutes of God that you learn from your spiritual heritage, that you learn from your Bible? 
You have stories to tell. Think about the first time you realized, oh, God's real. When's the first time that you were reading your Bible for yourself and the scriptures just came alive to you and you got revelation from God? When is the first time some of you heard the Lord speaking and drawing and you heard his voice for the first time? These are stories that your legacy, your heritage, those people around you, they need to hear. I love the saying we said on Wednesday night, if I only knew now what I I said it wrong. If I only knew then what I knew now. Make sure those people who are around you know what you wished you knew then if you know now what you wished you knew then. Wow, that's confusing. I hope you get my point. There's an importance in teaching. Teach your salvation story. Teach what God has done for you. Deep faith requires deep teaching. Let's look at the second application in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. As we continue reading, it says, so that you may follow them. This is how we stay centered today. We follow after God in all we do. I love what Elder Mike Dandy stated the other night. The word is the key to prospering in your future land. Do you want to know how to stay centered in your present so that God can prepare you for your future? The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, illuminating the Scriptures so that you get it. You know what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. Depart from evil. In all your ways, follow Him. Acknowledge Him. Deep faith requires deep teaching and deep following. Follow, follow, follow. God sends his word to you and I in advance for you through the teaching of the word, through prophetic ministry, through your scripture memorization, all of these things. He gives this as a gift to us in the present to prepare us for the future. Your success in following, deep following the ways of the Lord prepares you for your next steps, your promised land. We have to have deep teaching. We have to have deep following. The third application is found in verse 2. Do this so that you may fear the Lord, your God, all the days of your life. As we're teaching, as we're following, we must fear. We have to have a deep fear of the Lord. As we do what? As we teach, as we follow. But what's the deal with fear? You know, if, if you're new to this Bible thing, you almost feel like there's some contradiction in the scriptures. You've probably heard the saying, the scriptures say 365 times, fear not. Do not fear. You know, that's one don't fear for every day. But then we hear scriptures like this that says, fear me, fear me. So what's the deal, right? Where's the contradiction? Well, obviously, simply put, it's not a contradiction. You guys know that the Bible will never contradict itself. It simply comes in translation issues. You have to remember the original Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and then Greek. Then it wasn't translated to English. It was translated, I believe, to Latin in the Septuagint there. And then it, over time, morphed into English scriptures. So the word fear in the Hebrew here is yare. Yare has so many different English meanings, it's hard to, you, you just, when you read it and you study where it's talking about fear, you have to read it in context. And in here, we're talking about a lifestyle of reverence, to be in awe of God. And it could also include a little bit of fear, like when your mom says your first, middle, and last name simultaneously, David Nathaniel Goss. Oh, son, it was, I was in trouble when I heard those names. That, that, you know what happens when you, when you hear your name. I don't know what it was for you. You may have had a pet name, nickname. I don't know. But for me, it was David Nathaniel Goss. When I heard that, I knew, oh, uh-oh, I did something wrong. My mom loved me enough to say David Nathaniel Goss. She loved me so much, she didn't want me to keep ruining my life. So I had a healthy fear of mom and dad. Can you relate to that? 
Sometimes we have to have that type of fear of God, not because of what he's going to do to us, but because he loves us so much, we don't want our own choices to mess us up. Sometimes he'll call you. Remember, the Lord loves those whom he disciplines. We have to have a little bit of fear, of healthy fear of discipline and reverence and awe. So as we're teaching our future generations and those around us the stories and and the scriptures, as we are following those scriptures, those, those words from the Lord, we must do it with the fear of God. The, the fourth application here is also found in verse 2. He says, Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life, blah, 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 keeping all his statutes and commands, I'm giving you your son and your grandson. We're talking about deep family. Have you, have you heard the scripture say so many times, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Those aren't the three Hebrew amigos, father, son, grandson, or grandfather, father, son. You get the picture, right? Have you read Matthew chapter 1? There's 42 generations of uh, genealogy from Adam to Abraham to David to Jesus. God's wanting us to get a point, not that Matthew chapter 1 is boring because you can learn a bunch of people's names, but the fact is God wants that his heritage of faith is so embedded into you that it lasts for all your generations. Deep teaching, deep following with deep fear leads to deep family. The fear of God must be within us so that we can have a deep family. Stay centered in the present by appreciating the past and anticipating the future. Because when you do, it leads to this fifth one. And I love it. This is where we all go, yay! Deep blessings. Let's read chapter th- uh, verse 3. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may... Help me out here, please. Prosper. So that you may prosper and multiply greatly. Because Yahweh, the God of your father, says, promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, God's blessings are for those who love him, who follow him. He's a good, good daddy. He's a good father. He's a just father, and we fear him, but he's a good father. He is so good. You have to trust that the promise that you're longing for won't come by your own ways, but it'll only come by teaching, following with fear to your generations, to your legacy. Don't try to obtain the promises of God outside of the timing, the plan, and the will of God. It will, it'll mess you up. That was my screwdriver illustration. It will it will, it'll make your life miserable. It's not worth it. Trying to obtain your own promises, the promised land God has for you, you just, just don't. Focus your life on Christ. Give your all to Him. When you try to take your blessings and your promises in your own hands, you're going to mess it up. Because remember Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask, all that you think, all that you imagine, get you out of the way so he can give you abundantly above and beyond all that you can ask, think, or imagine. Stop struggling for your blessings and just stay focused. Stay centered on Christ. Trust his plan. His blessings are deep, deep blessings. Amen, please. Yes. Somebody needed to hear that today. God's blessings are laid out before us, but they are conditional. The conditional promise of blessings was given by God with the expectation that the children would actually obey. That the children of Israel would actually deeply teach, deeply follow, deeply fear. God didn't say, hey, listen, I know you're going to mess this up, but... Yeah, here's here's my word. I know you're not going to make it. No, no. He expected them to follow and obey. It's unusual when we don't. It's it's just an expectation God has for his children to obey because he loves you. 
He trusts you. God trusts you. Did you know that? God trusts you and I. He really does. He really, 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 really trusts you. Now, we know in, in here in Deuteronomy, the promised land was the, the promised land. It was the land flowing with milk and honey, right? It was with crops they didn't sow in the ground. It was with houses they didn't build. You have a promised land too. What does your promised land look like? Are you chasing something so hard that you're getting out of the will of God to pursue it? It ain't worth it. Have you even realized that God loves you and trusts you so much that he wants you to have blessings? Have you gotten to that place where you trust in the foundational truth that you serve a good father? I'm telling you, he's good. Trust him. Trust his timing. Trust his plan. Trust him, trust him, trust him. Mm. Deep blessings require deep teaching, deep following, with deep fear, because your family's going to go deep. Deep blessings. Mm. I feel like I need to say something, but I don't know if I should or not. Uh, let me go there. I'm going to go there. Um, I remember when I was in college, I was talking to one of our parents here recently, and uh, their, their child's going through some college stuff, and it's cool. But whenever Morgan and I uh, finished our three, well, <laughs> I finished my three years getting my associate's degree at Northeast. Um, after I finished my three years there, uh, Morgan had finished her two years. She had already gotten a scholarship to the University of Alabama because she's smart. She's brilliant. She works her fingers hard. Anyways, she is a faithful, faithful student, and so the Lord blessed her. And uh, I remember I was to the point where I was like, uh, what am I going to do in my life? Because I was working for Ron Schrader at a cabinet shop up the road. Oh, he wasn't there yet. I was working for at the cabinet shop, at the cabinet shop Ron works at. And uh, I knew at this season of my life, I loved Morgan and I wanted to marry her. And so Adam Drinkard, our youth pastor here at the time, said, David, why don't you propose to her? I'm like, yeah, let's make this thing. Let's put a ring on it, all right? Let's do it. And so anyways, in the middle of all this, Morgan's about to move to Tuscaloosa and go to college there. I'm, I'm like uh, twiddling my fingers like, I don't know what to do. Okay, so here's what I'll do. I'm, I'm an okay guitar player, so I'll go for the jazz band at, at the college. And so when I went to uh, try out for the jazz band there at Alabama, what I didn't know was that the, the associate arts director, the associate, anyway, the, the, the vice principal of that particular college was like a guitar legend. And uh, so anyways, I'm intimidated by him. I, I couldn't read my music. I was just strumming. He was so nice. He, he, he wasn't mean. Um, anyways, I'm like, all right, well, I just bombed that one. You know, and Morgan and mom and dad are like, oh, it's okay. So you probably did great. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, I, it was really bad. And so anyways, a month or so later comes back. Not only did I not get the scholarship, I didn't even get accepted into the program. It was that bad, y'all. I was. It was so bad. And I was like, Jesus, what do I do? I love her. I want to go to the University of Alabama with her. There's an incredible church down there I want to be a part of. What do I do? And so I, what, when you're in a season of life and you don't know what to do, make some time to fast and pray. So I was in the season of fasting and praying. To my lunch breaks, I would come to the old rock sanctuary, turn on the music, and just pray, pray, pray. And then one Sunday, uh, Jake's uh, dad, Pastor York here, he had been preparing us for a uh, uh, all-in offering. What do you call it? A first fruits offering. Which, if you don't know what a first fruits offering is, um, it's basically where instead of bringing ten percent to God, you bring a hundred. And so Pastor York is very wise. He gave us a couple months to plan and prepare, and and the Lord put it on my heart to give a first fruits offering. You know, so I gave a first fruits offering that Sunday, and I'm just like fasting over it, praying over it. The seed was sowed in the ground through my obedience to give, and then I kept watering it with prayer, and I put some fertilizer on it by fasting and just speaking the word of God. God, 
I trust your plan for my life. I, I was looking for my promised land. I was looking for where do we go next. And so in the middle of all of this, I, I'm working at a cabinet shop in Savannah. My mom calls me. And she says, David, the president of Northeast wants to, to bring you to his, uh, his office. He has said something about a scholarship. I'm like, okay. And she said, it's to Alabama. Okay. And so, anyways, what had happened was in the, in the background is I'm praying and sowing and fertilizing my promised land, reaching out for my future. God was doing some behind-the-scenes work that I didn't know about. That month, the president of the University of Alabama created a new scholarship to go to all of the community colleges in Alabama. And when that scholarship hit the desk of, um, oh, what's his name? Dr. David, Dr. Campbell at Northeast. He, he, he walked out into his uh, office with his secretary and her secretary, secretary, and said, I got this presidential scholarship, full tuition, University of Alabama. Who should we give it to? And, and we had a, uh, a Christian friend, Andrea, right? She was sitting there said, how about David Goss? He said, call him up. And so I walk in to Dr. Campbell's office, and I'm like, hi. And Andrew's over there just kind of smiling, and the other secretary's smiling. And I'm like, hi. And he said, uh, you know, his presidential a few words of, we're proud of what you're doing here. You did pretty good, blah, 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 blah. Here, uh, if you're interested, here's the scholarship to the University of Alabama for full tuition. Yeah! God created the promised land, and I didn't have to work to do it. Oh, wait, wait I, I, I take that back. I had to work to do it spiritually. The more I dug into just spiritually going after it, the more it produced fruit in the natural. My promised land was there. Oh, the story gets so much better. I'll fast forward. Uh, when I get there, um, one of our, our, our sister, well, uh, Daystar, in uh, Tuscaloosa, incredible church. The pastor shouted out one day from the audience, hey, we've got a couple of college kids moving to the area. If you feel like you want to take one in, let us know. One of the elders of the church called me, said, hey, I've got an extra bedroom. Do you want to live with us? It'll be rent-free. So I'm now living in the home of an elder rent-free. And you know how awesome it was? Because there was accountability between she and I, because we weren't married yet. There was accountability. And so God provided that. We're going down. She gets a room. I'm driving on the road one day, and we're just exploring Tuscaloosa because we're about to meet her future roommate and best friend. We're driving on this. We turn this one road, and I'm just about to turn around. I feel like the Lord said, go one more hill. So I go one more hill, and as I cross this hill, I look down. I'm like, well, that's a big music store. And so at that time in my life, I was teaching music lessons. And so I turn around. I later, I, I get a job like that. At, uh, teaching guitar there, selling guitars, pianos, stuff like that. God provided for my income. God provided my job. And what's so interesting is that I actually became a better student. Those, those were my two best years of college ever at the University of Alabama. Um, I found what major I was supposed to go on. My promised land was there. I didn't have to force it. I trusted the teaching of my pastor, York, at the time. I sowed my seed. I followed hard after the word of the Lord by fasting and praying and speaking the scripture over my seed. And I, I feared God. I mean, how many, I am not saying this proudly, but as like a 19 or 20 year old, how many of those do you know that fast a lot? There has, uh, never mind, I won't even go there. How many of you in this room don't even fast? I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. You should consider it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to. All I'm going to do is open an opportunity there. Every first Wednesday, we pray and we fast. I encourage you, take the opportunity. I'm not even looking at you, okay? So take the opportunity. <laughs> take the opportunity to fast because it's almost like pouring miracle grow on your seeds, on your prayers. It's awesome, and it changes who you are. And so anyways, wow, I got lost. Where was I going? Point being, oh yeah, deep teaching, deep following, deep fear, and I got to marry that girl. I got to stay with her. And our family came closer together. And it was just a good, good thing. 
Our hearts remain pure. Our, our bodies remain pure. And God provided a way. And it was during, I, I lean right now in my career as a, as a helper at the clinic, I lean more on that degree than I do my, my, my master's degree. So that season of life, I poured spiritual everything into. And God produced a harvest for us that's going to last for generations. That was not even on the radar to tell you that, but somebody needed to hear that. Deep teaching, deep following with deep fear. Keep it deep in your family and it produces deep blessings. This, this is deep faith. Next week, you know how you just heard my story? You're going to hear this church's story. I got some really great, uh, I got some good stuff to tell you about your spiritual heritage's legacy here at this church. Incredible things. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that today that faith has been built. Faith that comes only from your word. Father, I thank you that deep faith is entering into our hearts. I pray that it's entering into our spirits. I pray that we will begin to manifest our deep faith with our words and our actions. You said faith without works is dead. So, Lord, we want to see our faith produce works. God-fearing works. Lord, I pray first off, if there's anybody in this room who doesn't know you, I pray that the day is the day. If you're in this room, I don't want to embarrass you, but I do want to save you from an eternal hell by introducing you to Jesus. If you don't know him and you want to ask him to be the Lord and your Savior, if you felt something inside of you shift and you're like, I want to know that God who actually does miracles. I want to know that Savior who actually cared for me so much that he took my place on a cross, that he bore my sins. He thought of me, and he made a way for me to stand pure and clean before God the judge. If that's you, can I pray for you? We you lift your hand, anybody in this room? Amen. Amen. If you're in this room and you are longing, if you have a promised land, if you know what your promise is, but you just haven't realized it, you haven't experienced it, and it's driving you crazy because you can't figure it out, I'm going to pray for you too. The timing of God includes obedience. It includes so many things that just trust His timing. Some of you just need to trust the timing of God. The Holy Spirit will nudge your heart when to move. He will nudge your heart and give you directions. Trust Him. Have deep fear. Follow hard after Him. Teach others your story. It will produce deep blessings. If you are looking for your promised land and you, you, just, you just aren't realizing it, will you just show your hand to God right now? Whatever your promised land is. It may not be a location. It may be a... a Maybe a career, maybe a person. Come on, show God. Show God. Don't show me. Show God. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm not even going to look at you for 10 seconds. If you're looking for something and you just haven't been fulfilled and you can't find it yet, show God right now. I'm going to give you three more seconds. So, Father God, you saw the hands that were lifted. You saw the hearts that were moved. And, Lord, I pray right now, in the name of Jesus, that first, <laughs> will you just visit with them right now in this room? Holy Spirit, pour out your love on them. Pour out your kindness. Lord, if they need hope, stir hope within their hearts. For those who don't even know that they're they're striving on their own to obtain the promise of God for their life. I pray that you will this week begin to nudge their hearts. May they deepen their faith, God. Their legacies are depending upon it. May they reach out to their spiritual heritage, those spiritual leaders in their lives who are speaking to them, who, who can guide and guard and, and walk with them in accountability. May they reach out, Father. Father, I pray that you will instill a, a continual deep fear for you in this place. Father, a fear of reverence, of awe, of the wonders of God. 
Lord, we just thank you that over these next even six weeks, over these next six weeks, that some people in this room will obtain their promise. I just feel that in my spirit. Somebody within six weeks will obtain their promise, their promised land. You have to stop the striving, though. You have to stop making it work on your own, and you have to fully lean and trust and rely on God. Dig into His Word. So with, so with tears, so with prayers, fast. Change your lifestyle if you have to. Come on, get real with God. Lord, I just thank you that in, even, even in like in seven weeks from today, that we're going to hear testimonies, stories of the works and wonders and miracles of God. I believe it. And I, I release it, Father, as the, as the pastor, as the spiritual head of this house. Father, we release blessing, God. We pray for the blessing of God that can only come through deep faith. In Jesus' mighty name. Yes, Lord. Somebody say yes and amen. 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 This is fun. Bragging on God is fun. You should try it. All right, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop talking. At this time, Brother Mike Dindy, come on up. Um, prepare the offering and also these lovely announcements here as well, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Do you want this down here? Cool. Okay, I'll do the announcements real quick here. Um, the first two are on, on behalf of Livingstone Christian Academy. Where's my LSCAA kids? I know we got one here. There's like five of our kids in this church who go to the Livingstone Christian Academy. And they are performing Winnie the Pooh, May 1st at 7 p.m. Yeah, where did Tigger find Pooh? In the toilet. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, a second... Yeah, some of you got it. Some of you uh, also need to hear the second announcement. Bits and Pieces Spring Showcase will happen on May 13th. That's where they get to do drama. Uh, I believe they're doing uh, choirs and performances, dancing, and that will be at 7 p.m. So, you know, Livingstone's one of our monthly con uh, folks that we sow into financially. And uh, May 1st, they have a 7 p.m. Winnie the Pooh performance. And May 13th, sure. they have a 7 p.m. Bits and Pieces Spring Showcase. And finally, this Wednesday night, we'll continue with our uh, live group Bible study here. And also our teenagers meet as well. Mike Denny, take it away, sir. I love the fact that David was talking about faith today. Uh, your tithes and your offerings.